Welcome to part 33 of the Ultimate Unsolved Mysteries Iceberg. Let's get to the cases. The 1972 Montreal Museum of Fine Arts Heist. In September 1972, the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts was targeted in what would become one of the most daring art heists in Canadian history. The thieves managed to make off with an impressive haul, stealing 18 valuable paintings worth an estimated $2 million Canadian. Adjusted for inflation and converted to American dollars, the bandits made off with more than $10 million worth of art. However, given that the works were by highly acclaimed artists such as Rembrandt and Rubens, it has been estimated that the true value today is significantly more than this. The thieves, believed to be a group of three male professionals, carefully studied the museum's security measures and devised a clever strategy to bypass them. They entered the museum under the guise of construction workers blending in seamlessly with the legitimate contractors who were performing renovations at the time. They entered through a skylight and slid down into the museum using a rope. And yes, before you ask, this heist is basically the inspiration for every museum heist you ever saw in a movie or cartoon. Once inside, they swiftly disabled the alarm system and were also able to locate and disable all the guards on duty. Once they had neutralized all immediate threats, they systematically removed the targeted paintings from their frames. Eventually, the authorities were notified of the heist. However, by the time authorities arrived on the scene, the perpetrators had already made their escape, leaving behind little evidence to trace their whereabouts. The museum guards could only provide the most basic of descriptions, the two men they actually saw were of average height and build, wore ski masks, and had long hair. They reported that two of the men spoke French, while one spoke English. Given the extreme vagueness of the description, a significant number of Montreal's city male population could fit the description. In the aftermath of the heist, authorities launched an extensive investigation, but leads quickly ran cold. The stolen paintings, some of which were considered treasures, have remained missing for years, fueling speculation within the art world. Despite numerous theories and occasional sightings, the whereabouts of the stolen artworks remained a mystery for decades. However, in 1999, a tip led authorities to a storage locker in Miami, Florida, where they uncovered several of the stolen paintings. The discovery reignited hopes of recovering the remaining missing artworks and shedding light on the full extent of the heist. The identities of the thieves, their motives, and the fate of the remaining stolen paintings are still unknown. Some have theorized that the heist was organized by the city's mafia outfit, amongst the most powerful and influential in the underworld. Others have speculated that the heist was designed with the purpose of acquiring a specific piece for a high-profile buyer. Under this theory, the additional pieces were stolen either opportunistically as a quote bonus or to confuse investigators. In support of this theory is the fact that some of the pieces may not have been sold and may have just been deposited in Miami. Notably, despite this case now being over 50 years old, the case remains open and under active investigation. The Von Erich Family Curse The Von Erich Family, an iconic name in professional wrestling, has been marked by a series of tragic events, often referred to as the Von Erich Curse. The patriarch of the family, Jack Adkisson, better known by his ring name Fritz Von Erich, was a notable figure in wrestling. He crafted a villainous persona in the ring, which played a significant part in his fame. For those unfamiliar with wrestling, this is a role known as a heel. And let's just say, these guys don't play by the rules. Further, in the ring, Fritz was promoted as being associated with the guy who plunged the world into chaos during the 1930s and 1940s. But for clarity for those unfamiliar with wrestling, he was not associated with any such beliefs. This was just an act to make the audience hate him more. Fritz had six sons, 
five of whom followed him into wrestling, Kevin, David, Carrie, Mike, and Chris. Each of these sons faced personal and professional challenges, and except for Kevin, each of their lives ended prematurely under tragic circumstances. The string of tragedies began with the passing of Fritz's first son, Jack Jr., in a tragic accident at just six years old in 1959. This event predated the wrestling careers of his brothers, but set a somber tone for the family's legacy. David Von Erich, known as the Yellow Rose of Texas, was one of the brightest stars in the family. He passed in 1984 during a tour in Japan, officially due to acute enteritis. However, there were widespread speculations and claims about the involvement of painkillers in his passing. Kerry Von Erich, another prominent figure, faced numerous personal struggles, including a serious motorcycle accident in 1986 that eventually led to the amputation of his right foot. Despite this, he continued to wrestle, hiding his amputation from fans. His life, too, ended tragically in 1993 as a result of mental health struggles, stemming largely from the motorcycle accident and its consequences. Mike Von Erich had yet another heartbreaking story and tragic ending. After undergoing surgery, he suffered from toxic shock syndrome, which significantly deteriorated his health and professional wrestling ability. He suffered brain damage as a result of an extended extremely high fever. His struggle with his health then culminated in his tragic demise in 1987. Chris Von Erich, the youngest, also wrestled but struggled to live up to the family's legacy, which weighed heavily on him. The family was known for their significant stature and physical presence, which Chris, at 5'5", simply didn't have, according to wrestling analysts. He too passed young and completed the series of losses that devastated the Von Erich family and contributed to the myth of the curse. Despite these tragedies, Kevin Von Erich, the sole surviving son of Fritz, has managed to carry on the family name. He has spoken publicly about the immense personal loss he has endured, but has found a way to continue his life and legacy, raising a family of his own. In an alternative universe, there's a world where the second generation of the Von Erich family absolutely dominated the pro wrestling scene throughout the 80s and 90s. This has led to significant speculation by fans and analysts about what may have been had the family not been struck with such tragedy. But good news for the Von Erichs. Kevin's sons Marshall and Ross are having success in the professional wrestling world. They are presently signed to the AEW, the major competitor of the WWE. The Slaying of Faith Hedgepeth In the early hours of September 7, 2012, Faith Hedgepeth's life came to a tragic end in her Chapel Hill apartment, igniting a complex investigation that spanned nearly a decade. Faith, a 19-year-old student at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, was found by friends in a disturbing scene that prompted an immediate law enforcement response. Her involvement in Native American cultural events and aspirations for the future highlighted the profound loss felt by the community and her Haliwa Saponi tribe. Notably, her tribe would play a significant role in ensuring Faith's case did not go cold. The evening preceding the discovery Faith and her roommate visited a local nightclub, returning home in the early hours. Notably, disturbances were reported by a neighbor shortly after their return. Communications from Faith's phone to acquaintances in the early morning hours, along with the roommate's departure and return, were key details in reconstructing the timeline of that night. Despite a swift law enforcement response, the case was marred by challenges. Initial efforts to gather and analyze evidence, including DNA collected at the scene, did not immediately lead to a suspect. The investigation faced scrutiny for the decision to seal case records, which some speculated could be concealing investigative missteps. This sealing was contested by media outlets, 
arguing for public access to the investigation's progress. The community, along with the Haliwasaponi tribe, rallied for justice, contributing to a reward fund in hopes of encouraging leads. Breakthroughs in the case came from advances in forensic analysis and the persistent efforts of detectives. Notably, this was one of the first cases where the DNA found at the scene was used to create a probabilistic sketch of what the offender may have looked like. These efforts culminated in the arrest of Miguel Salguero Olivares in September 2021 on a first-degree ending charge. Notably, none of the allegations against the accused have been proven in a court of law, and he remains innocent until proven guilty. I note that despite the arrest of Salguero, as well as the charges brought against him, the details on what led to this charge are extremely scant. In January 2022, authorities indicated that the full story would, quote, take time to completely unfold, suggesting potentially additional forces at play. I note that as of April 2024, there have been no further updates in this case, though as of at least September 2023, Salguero remains in pretrial detention. I hope to have an update on this case in a future entry to this series. Jimmy here, the YouTuber behind the Lazy Chill Zone channel. If you're enjoying my content, please hit the like and subscribe buttons and the notification bell. Also, consider signing up for a YouTube membership and joining the Patreon. Also, remember to join the Discord community. We're nearing 80 members now, and the community is super active. Click the link in the description. Astral Projection Astral projection, also known as an out-of-body experience, is the phenomenon where an individual's consciousness separates from their physical body to explore other dimensions of reality. This practice, rooted in ancient traditions and New Age beliefs, is believed to allow the astral body to journey through the astral plane, a realm beyond the physical. Historically, the concept of astral projection has appeared in various cultures worldwide. Ancient Egyptian teachings suggest that the soul could hover outside the physical body and even act as a doppelganger type entity in certain situations. Similarly, Various indigenous and eastern traditions, including the Inuit and Hindu cultures, describe abilities akin to astral projection. In these instances where individuals travel outside their bodies, they generally do so to gain wisdom or perform otherwise impossible tasks. In more modern contexts, astral projection is often associated with spiritual and personal growth. It is viewed as a method for exploring the depths of consciousness and the universe. Techniques for achieving astral projection vary, but typically involve deep relaxation, a focus on mental clarity, and specific visualization practices. Practitioners often report experiences of traveling to different locations or realms and interacting with different entities or experiencing a profound connection with the universe. Despite its rich anecdotal history, astral projection remains scientifically unverified, with experiences largely subjective and reported primarily through personal testimonies. The practice is sometimes linked with meditation and mindfulness techniques, which are thought to facilitate the loosening of consciousness from the physical body to achieve these experiences. Critics of astral projection often question the veracity of the experiences, suggesting they may be lucid dreams or hallucinations. However, those who practice and believe in astral projection value it for the profound personal insight and spiritual connection it purportedly provides. For many, it offers a transformative journey that expands their understanding of the self and the universe, fostering a greater appreciation for the mystery and interconnectedness of life. Perhaps with further understanding of the capabilities of the brain and the interconnectedness of all things, the reality of these subjective experiences will one day be verified. 
Also, as a quick aside, remote viewing, a distinct but related topic, will be covered later in this series. The Slaying of Reynaldo John Rivera in the early 1980s, the city of Santa Fe, New Mexico, was shaken by the tragic end of Father Reynaldo John Rivera. Born in Santa Fe in 1924, Father Reynaldo was a devoted priest, deeply embedded in his community, and known for his willingness to assist those in need. Ordained in 1953, he was later appointed rector of St. Francis Cathedral in 1975 where he remained until his untimely demise in 1982. The events leading to Father Ronaldo's demise began on the evening of August 5, 1982, when he received a call at his rectory from a man claiming that his grandfather needed last rites near a rest stop in Waldo. Father Ronaldo drove to the location but never returned. Two days later, his body was discovered in a field near the La Bajada rest stop. Despite a thorough investigation, including examining fingerprints found in his abandoned car and a psychological profile developed by the FBI, the identity of his assailants remained a mystery. George Semkis, a suspect linked to the case, was arrested but never charged with the crime due to insufficient evidence, leaving questions around Father Ronaldo's demise unanswered. Semkis was previously accused of having stolen from Rivera's cathedral, and some theorized that this led to Semkis coming for Rivera. Complicating matters further, the slaying and disappearance of other priests during the same period added layers of mystery to an already perplexing situation. Parallelly, the case took an intriguing turn with the disappearance and presumed death of Reverend John Patrick Kerrigan in Montana two years later under eerily similar circumstances. The similarities between the two cases, such as the victim's cars being found away from the crime scenes, fueled theories of a possible connection. Kerrigan's past, which included time spent in New Mexico, raised questions about a potential link between the two men. However, law enforcement has remained divided on whether the two incidents were connected and no conclusive evidence has been presented to link the cases definitively. Further, there is the theory that Kerrigan, unlike Rivera, was not actually ended, but rather that Kerrigan left of his own accord to dodge accusations of unnatural activities with minors. Further, there was the unexplained demise of Father Ben Carrier in Arizona, with theories ranging from serial predation on clergy to connections with broader church scandal. The Amber Room. The Amber Room, a testament to opulence and craftsmanship, holds a storied history that spans centuries. Constructed with intricate panels made of amber, gold leaf, and mirrors, the Amber Room was hailed as one of the eighth wonders of the world for its unparalleled beauty. Crafted in 1701, this magnificent chamber was intended for the Charlottenburg Palace in Berlin, Prussia, but was eventually installed at the Berlin City Palace. It was designed by German sculptor Andreas Schluter and Danish amber craftsman Gottfried Wolfram. However, in 1716, it was gifted from the King of Prussia to Peter the Great of Russia symbolizing a bond of friendship and alliance between the two nations. After it was installed in the Catherine Palace near St. Petersburg, it covered more than 590 square feet and contained over six tons of amber. However, in 1941, German troops invaded the Soviet Union and seized the chamber from the Catherine Palace and took it to Königsberg for reconstruction and exhibition. In early 1944, as Allied forces approached Germany, the room was carefully disassembled and packed into crates for storage in the basement of the castle. However, Königsberg was struck by heavy Allied bombings in August 1944, and records of the room's whereabouts disappeared without a trace, leaving behind a mystery. Various theories abound regarding the fate of the Amber Room. Some believe it was destroyed during the chaos of war, 
while others speculate that it was hidden or stolen and may still exist somewhere waiting to be discovered. In the aftermath of World War II, efforts were made to recreate the Amber Room using old photographs and surviving fragments of the original panels. A reconstruction started in 1979 in the Catherine Palace. After decades of work by Russian craftsmen and donations from Germany, it was completed in 2003, ensuring its legacy. The Emirates Flight 203 Incident On September 5, 2018, Emirates Flight 203 from Dubai to New York's JFK Airport became a widely reported incident when it was quarantined upon arrival. A large number of passengers and crew were reporting a mysterious illness. The flight, carried by an Airbus A380, had 549 people on board. Shortly after landing at 9.18 a.m., concerns escalated when around 100 individuals showed symptoms like cough, fever, and gastrointestinal distress. Initial reports varied significantly about the number of affected passengers. However, according to the Centers for Disease Control, 11 people were eventually hospitalized for further examination, while others were treated at the airport. The situation caused alarm, leading to a substantial emergency response, including ambulances and health officials at JFK Airport. The CDC took an active role in the screening process, ensuring that all passengers were evaluated before they could leave the plane. Social media played a significant role in broadcasting real-time updates from passengers inside the aircraft. One of those who was providing updates in real-time was the 90s rapper Vanilla Ice, who remarked on the severity of the situation from the upper deck of the double-decker plane. The aircraft was cleared and returned to service later the same day. The exact cause of the illness outbreak on board remains undetermined marking the event as a peculiar and unsettling episode for those involved in the public. It has been commonly speculated that this was a quite severe outbreak of mass hysteria, though it is unclear what triggered it. Mass hysteria, also known as collective hysteria or group hysteria, involves the rapid spread of illness symptoms among a group, often without an identifiable physical cause. These episodes, usually triggered by stress or fear within a close community, manifest in physical symptoms like dizziness, fainting, or nausea. Psychological contagion plays a crucial role where witnessing symptoms in others can precipitate similar experiences in oneself. Mass hysteria cases often resolve once the underlying anxieties are addressed as they did in this case for the vast majority of people once they were off the plane. Further, there is always the potential that some people were knowingly going along with it in an effort to have their airfare refunded or to receive other forms of compensation from the airline. The Oil Pit Squid Shout out to frequent commenter and community member Austin Lee for this super cool and obscure suggestion. In 1996, workers at the GMC Delphi Interior and Lighting Plant in Anderson, Indiana, encountered an unusual phenomenon. Small, squid-like creatures in a sludge pit containing a mixture of oil, antifreeze, and automobile parts. These oil pit squids, as they came to be known, were approximately six to eight inches long and grayish red in color. The workers allegedly managed to capture one of these creatures in a jar, but it mysteriously disappeared soon after. Despite this bizarre sighting, there was little concrete evidence to substantiate the existence of these squids, leading to speculation about their origin and nature. Some have proposed that these creatures could be a type of mutated earthworm or other simple life form adapted to the toxic environment. Others suggested more exotic theories, including the possibility that these are alien entities which are able to live in extreme environments. A more down-to-earth suggestion, pun intended, is that these are an unknown creature from the ocean depths capable of handling extreme environments. 
At present, it doesn't appear that there has been any further sightings of this cryptid since 1996. And as such, this one likely straddles the line between cryptid and urban legend. The Aurora, Texas Incident The Aurora Incident of 1897 is an event in early modern UFO lore, marked by an alleged airship crash in the small town of Aurora, Texas. On the morning of April 17, 1897, residents were startled by what appeared to be a cigar-shaped airship that crashed into Judge Proctor's windmill. This caused a significant explosion that destroyed the windmill and the judge's flower garden. The local newspaper, the Dallas Morning News, published a detailed account two days later describing the shrekage and an alleged extraterrestrial pilot who was reportedly found among the debris. This pilot was said to have been buried in the local cemetery following a small funeral, presumably in accordance with local tradition rather than the traditions of the extraterrestrial itself. According to reports, the wreckage was examined by townspeople and a purported expert on astronomy named T.J. Weems, who speculated that the pilot might have been from Mars. This detail catered to the late 19th century fascination with Mars and extraterrestrial life, influenced by contemporary astronomical theories and the widespread Mars fever of the era. The materials found at the crash site were described as being made of a metal resembling aluminum and silver, and there were claims of mysterious hieroglyphic papers found with the pilot. Over the years, the incident has attracted significant attention and skepticism, leading many to speculate about the authenticity of the event. Investigations throughout the 20th century, including efforts by the Mutual UFO Network, better known as MUFON, and various historians and journalists have resulted in mixed conclusions. For instance, a 1979 report interviewed a local resident who claimed that the story was fabricated by the newspaper. The reasoning for this being a means to draw attention to the struggling town, which had been bypassed by the railroad and was economically declining. Despite ongoing skepticism and numerous investigations, no conclusive evidence has been found to fully confirm or refute the claims made in the original 1897 article. The pilot's grave remains unexcavated to this day, with modern technology such as ground-penetrating radar being employed to explore the site without disturbing it. Yet local authorities have consistently denied permission for exhumation, keeping the mystery alive. To me, it seems that this could easily be resolved by exhuming the alleged body, and I suspect that local authorities' refusal to do so indicates there's likely nothing of substance there. After all, Aurora is a fairly major UFO enthusiast pilgrimage site. It's no Roswell or Area 51, but the surrounding lore definitely generates income for the residents. European Vampires Vampires, creatures that instill both horror and fascination, are deeply rooted in European folklore. They are commonly portrayed as undead beings that prey on humans to consume their life essence in one form or another. This characteristic is central to the myths and legends of the vampire that span across various cultures in Europe. Other characteristics associated with vampires are dependent upon local lore or variants within lore. Vampires in folklore are often described as having supernatural abilities, such as superhuman strength and speed, which they use to overpower their victims. They are typically depicted as nocturnal creatures, sensitive to sunlight, and having specific vulnerabilities such as a stake through the heart or exposure to holy objects. Other vampires are noted to have an aversion to garlic, with the most commonly suggested reason for this is that garlic wards off certain insects associated with pestilence. Importantly, vampiric legends are popular across the world. However, in this segment, I'll be discussing the European variant exclusively. Historically, the fear of vampires intensified during times of disease outbreaks in medieval Europe. People, 
lacking a modern understanding of infectious diseases, often attributed inexplicable illnesses and deaths to vampires. The corpses of those suspected to be vampires were sometimes exhumed and rituals performed to prevent them from rising from the dead. This practice was part of a broader vampire superstition that thrived especially during the Middle Ages. The modern vampire myth permeates literature and culture in general, with Bram Stoker's 1897 novel Dracula being the most iconic. This tale of a Transylvanian count who travels to England to diversify his real estate holdings and spread his undead curse has become the basis for the modern portrayal of vampires. Stoker's Dracula was inspired by European folklore and historical figures such as Vlad the Impaler, although Stoker did not directly base Dracula's character on this Romanian ruler. Different European cultures have their unique vampire legends. For instance, the Slavic Upir is known for its ability to drain life force by mere touch or gaze. While the term Nosferatu from Transylvanian German and Romanian lore is described as a creature of the night with pale skin and long fangs. The enduring fascination with vampires is evident not only in folklore and literature, but also in modern media, and even in individuals who identify with vampirism today. Communities of self-described vampires exist, often engaging in rituals, though individuals maintaining such a lifestyle generally do so in secret. The Enfield Monster. The Enfield Monster, a cryptid reported in Enfield, Illinois in 1973, has remained a tantalizing mystery and a favorite among cryptozoologists and enthusiasts of the unexplained. On a quiet night in April of that year, the small town of Enfield became the center of a bizarre incident. The tale began with Henry McDaniel, who claimed to have encountered a strange creature at his home on the night of April 25th. McDaniel described the being as having three legs, short arms, big pink eyes the size of flashlights, and a body about five feet tall with a grayish hue. The creature allegedly hissed at McDaniel before leaping away with great bounds, a movement that seemed unnatural and otherworldly. The incident quickly escalated as McDaniel's account attracted local and then national attention. Further sightings were reported, and the story expanded with each retelling. Neighbors and townspeople joined in a mix of fear and fascination. Some residents even armed themselves, while skeptics dismissed the accounts as mass hysteria or hoaxes, while others suggested that McDaniel was under the influence. The initial investigation by local authorities found unusual tracks near McDaniel's home, which added to the intrigue. The tracks appeared dog-like but had an anomalous six-toe pattern suggesting that this wasn't your average pupperino. Despite these peculiar findings, the police and subsequent investigations suggested that McDaniel was sober and rational during his encounter. A subsequent sighting on May 6, 1973 suggested that the creature was actually more ape-like. This led to the gathering of a local posse by McDaniel to hunt down this supposed creature. Interestingly, this unauthorized monster hunting posse attracted the attention of the local authorities, with the local sheriff delivering a truly legendary quote about the creature. The sheriff said that the posse was simply, quote, out drinking and raising hell. A number of different explanations have been posited for this incident. The kangaroo theory claims that the Enfield monster might be an escaped kangaroo, misidentified due to its unusual silhouette and bounding movements. Skeptics and locals speculated that this outlandish explanation could account for the creature's three-legged appearance and impressive leaps, as described by eyewitnesses. However, this theory has come under fire lacking substantial evidence or other credible sightings of a kangaroo in the area. I wouldn't be so quick to dismiss the kangaroo theory, though, as a man who lived somewhat nearby reported that his pet kangaroo had been stolen the previous year. 
Another theory suggests that this was simply a case of mass hysteria, perhaps overlaid upon a real kangaroo sighting. This may also explain why there were no kangaroo sightings at the time. All kangaroo sightings were simply attributed to the Enfield monster due to this psychological overlay. Others have proposed that the creature was an alien being of some sort, or perhaps an interdimensional being, though again, no evidence exists for this. Others propose that it was a genetic anomaly of a known creature, which of course cannot be ruled out. The Enfield monster has not been sighted since, but has now entered into the pantheon of modern cryptids. The Min Min Lights. This is a recommendation by community member Suddenly That Enderman. Thanks for this amazing suggestion. The Min Min Lights are a mysterious phenomenon predominantly observed in the channel country of Western Queensland, Australia. These lights, which have perplexed observers for over a century, manifest as glowing orbs that can suddenly appear and move erratically across the sky. Their unpredictable nature and eerie glow have inspired numerous folk tales and scientific inquiries. The term Min Min originates from a small, now abandoned settlement in Queensland, where the lights were frequently reported. According to local legend, the first European sighting occurred in 1918 near the Min Min Hotel, forever linking the name to these enigmatic appearances. Indigenous Australians have long been aware of these lights, interpreting them through the lens of cultural lore that often links the phenomenon to spiritual or ancestral realms. These lights are often viewed by the indigenous population as sacred and not to be trifled with. Scientific interest in the Min Min lights gained momentum in the late 20th and early 21st centuries. Jack Pettigrew of the University of Queensland was a prominent researcher who proposed that the lights could be explained by natural phenomena. He suggested that they are a form of mirage or fata morgana, where light from a distant source, like a campfire or vehicle, is bent by thermal layers in the atmosphere. This optical illusion can make distant lights seem eerily close and mobile, contributing to the mysterious nature of the sightings. Despite scientific explanations, the Min Min lights continue to hold a place in popular culture and folklore. The Cape Town Paid Companionship Worker Slayer. The Cape Town Paid Companionship Worker Slayer, also known as the Cape Town Strangler, was an unidentified individual responsible for the tragic end of 16 women in Cape Town. The criminal's method involved picking up victims on rainy nights, ending them via strangulation within his vehicle, and disposing of them in pre-selected locations. This pattern was consistent across all cases, with the attacker ensuring the victims were left in varying locations to avoid detection. One unique aspect of these cases was that the criminal attempted to stage the crime scenes, posing victims to mislead investigations. Notably, none of the women were subject to indecent assaults prior to their slayings. This detail, among others, led to difficulties in linking the crimes directly to one individual. The police did make an arrest and charge in relation to one of the slayings, however, for reasons that are about to be abundantly clear. I'm not going to repeat this man's name here. The police released this man due to lack of evidence, and it was later found that the authorities falsified the evidence against him in an attempt to tie him to the crime. According to an interview with a survivor, the individual was a well-put-together white male in his 20s or 30s and appeared to be a professional of some sort. It is unclear if this matter is still being actively investigated today. The Cow Tipping Urban Legend Cow tipping, a popular notion often depicted in media and pop culture generally, involves the supposed activity of sneaking up on unsuspecting upright cows and pushing them over for amusement. Cow tipping relies upon the assumption that cows sleep standing up. However, the idea that cows sleep standing up, 
which is central to the concept, is incorrect. Cows actually sleep lying down, not standing up, and they are far more aware of their surroundings than the myth assumes. They can detect threats and disturbances from considerable distances and are capable of waking quickly from sleep. This natural vigilance makes the stealth approach described in cow tipping tales highly improbable. Moreover, the physical logistics of cow tipping further debunk the myth. Cows are large, heavy animals, typically weighing around 1,500 pounds. They have a low center of gravity and sturdy, wide-set legs that provide stability. Physically tipping a cow would require immense force, much more than what a few people could generate. One study suggests that it would require up to six strong people to exert the necessary force simultaneously, a scenario that's highly unlikely and practically unfeasible. That said, this doesn't mean it's impossible. For instance, if some sturdy athletes got together and combined forces to tip a cow, I'm betting on the athletes, not the poor bovine. Another element of cow tipping suggests that cows meet their demise upon their stomachs becoming entangled during the tipping process. However, there is no indication that the act of tipping these creatures would cause such a stomach tangling issue. What would happen in a cow tipping event is that the cow, given its immense size, would almost certainly suffer significant orthopedic injuries as a result of this supposed prank. This would necessitate the cow being rendered the opposite of alive, if you catch my drift. The Gotoku Neko The Gotoku Neko is a captivating figure in Japanese folklore, particularly renowned through the artwork of Toriyama Seiken in his Yokai Compendium, The Illustrated Book of 100 Demons. This collection famously features various yokai, which are spirits or monsters from traditional Japanese folklore. The Gotoku Neko, translating literally to tripod cat, is depicted uniquely, utilizing common household items in its portrayal. The creature is shown wearing a Gotoku, a three or four legged stand used for kettles over fires, on its head resembling a crown, and using a bamboo blowpipe used for stoking fires. It is unclear if the Gotoku Neko was a well-known yokai prior to Seiken's portrayal of the creature, though most of his illustrations drew strongly upon various folk beliefs and religious traditions. The powers of the Gotoku Neko primarily revolve around fire. The creature's ability to manipulate fire using traditional tools suggests a level of supernatural influence over elemental forces a feature typical of yokai. Other features of this cat yokai are its abilities to use household tools much like a human, which is a pretty fantastic power for a creature with no opposable thumbs. The disappearance and slaying of Sharon Crawford. Sharon Michelle Crawford, a 43-year-old mother of four, went missing from Donaldsonville, Georgia on November 8, 2018. Her disappearance followed the chaos of Hurricane Michael, which had hit the area a month prior. Despite extensive searches, it was not until February 2020 that her skeletal remains were discovered in a field just north of Donaldsonville. Despite the state in which she was found, there was significant evidence of foul play. This grim find was on Burlane Road and Robbie Forest Road, and her remains were positively identified later in September. The case of Sharon Crawford has attracted significant attention, partly due to the mysterious circumstances surrounding her disappearance and the brutal nature of her passing. Several theories have been proposed regarding the motives and identity of the perpetrator. Among these, local speculation has often pointed to possible connections between the chaos post-Hurricane Michael and her subsequent disappearance. This theory suggests that the disorder in the wake of the disaster might have been exploited by the perpetrator. This theory is supported circumstantially by all emergency forces being focused on the aftermath of the hurricane. Law enforcement agencies, including the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, 
have been involved in the case. However, no suspects have been publicly identified and the investigation remains open. The community and Crawford's family continue to seek closure and justice, holding on to hope that new evidence will eventually lead to the resolution of this tragic case. If you have any information with respect to Sharon Crawford's case, please reach out to the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. The House of 1000 Ghosts. The House of 1000 Ghosts is a historic mansion located in Belgium. The name itself clearly hints at the mysterious and eerie reputation surrounding the property. Situated amidst dense forests, this haunted house has long been a subject of fascination and intrigue for locals and visitors alike. This now abandoned building used to be a spooky themed restaurant and bar and offered an occult themed dining experience from 1997 to 2008. It was considered one of the most morbid restaurants in the world because of its haunted reputation. Every detail in this establishment, including furnishings and the interior, was made in an occult theme and with high quality craftsmanship. Fog came out from the ceiling and doors creaked and shut on their own, which personally isn't what I'm looking for in my dining experience. The eyes of paintings followed visitors' moves and plenty of animatronic monsters peered from hidden corners, adding to the vibe. The image of a horror restaurant was completed by all sorts of flying objects, dishes, furniture, paintings, all flying around, very unsettling. A unique menu was offered as well, featuring mud pie with spicy worms, entrees served in skulls and bats marinated in spider sauce. Waiters and waitresses were dressed as vampires and other scary monsters to enhance the eerie atmosphere. However, at the very peak of the restaurant's popularity, rumors began circulating about a secret room where alleged satanic rituals took place. These rumors also included allegations that guests, quote, disappeared and had potentially been sacrificed. Additionally, Employees shared eerie stories about ghosts inhabiting the building, some of which were said to be extremely malevolent. All this had a negative impact on the restaurant's once semi-playful reputation, which ultimately led to fewer and fewer visitors. In 2008, the restaurant abruptly closed with the entire interior remaining unchanged. Currently, the building is abandoned with everything left intact serving as a destination for more adventurous tourists and urban explorers. The Vanishing of Forrest Preston. This is another missing persons case that hasn't received nearly enough visibility. Forrest Preston, a 51-year-old man, mysteriously disappeared from Columbus, Georgia on January 7, 2021. Notably, according to all sources I was able to find, Forrest goes by the name Clay, and as such, I'll refer to him as Clay throughout the rest of this segment. He was last seen around Warm Springs Road in Columbus, a location he was known to frequent. At the time of his disappearance, Preston was without a phone, vehicle, or permanent address, and was unemployed, which adds layers of complexity to his case. According to his daughter, Anna, the two would speak every few months just to confirm that Clay was doing okay. Preston is described as a Caucasian male with blonde hair and blue eyes, standing 5 feet 10 inches tall and weighing 150 pounds. His distinguishing physical features include a pronounced limp, a scar behind his right ear extending down to his neck, and a distinctive tattoo on his upper left arm depicting a grave. The lack of substantial leads and the minimal details available have made Preston's case particularly challenging for investigators. The Columbus Police Department continues to seek information from the public that could assist in locating him. Several theories circulate regarding Preston's disappearance, but it is important to note that they are all speculative. One prevalent theory suggests that his lifestyle might have made him a prime target for foul play. 
Unfortunately, if you've watched this series up until this point, or if you have any interest in true crime, you know that predators are cowards who target vulnerable people on the outskirts of society. Serial wrongdoers are often able to commit their heinous acts repeatedly as the authorities generally assign little resources to investigating crimes against the down and out. This case remains active with the Columbus, Georgia Police Department. I urge anyone with information to come forward to the authorities regarding Clay's disappearance. Also, as a quick aside, I want to acknowledge Anna Preston's advocacy on the part of her father for keeping his story from fading away. The only way missing people aren't simply forgotten is by keeping attention on their cases. Batu Khan's Golden Horses Batu Khan's Golden Horses refer to a legendary treasure said to have belonged to Batu Khan, a prominent Mongol ruler and founder of the Golden Horde. He was Genghis Khan's grandson and ruled over the Kievan Rus, Volga Bulgaria, Kumania, and the Caucasus. While the Golden Horde was nominally subject to the power of the Great Khan, the Great Khan ruled from China and was busy with consolidation of power there. The Golden Horde would go on to rule over the western portion of the Eurasian steppe for almost 250 years, a period in Russian history referred to as the Tatar Yoke. With the help of the best craftsmen Eurasia had to offer, he built the capital of his empire and named it Sarai Batu. Notably, this city was the largest city in Europe at the time, with a population of nearly 100,000 people. Of all cities in Europe at that time, only Paris came close in size. Notably, the vast majority of the population of Sarai Batu was not there willingly, with the majority of the population being captured from the Russian lands. But back to the city and the golden horses, gardens were laid out in the city and fountains were installed, a very unusual sight on the steppes. When Batu Khan's beloved Arabian horse died, he ordered a statue to be cast from pure gold in its life-size and likeness. According to the legend, the life-size figure of a horse required about 15 tons of gold, which seems excessive, but I'm no gold horse sculptor. This was supposedly the equivalent to the entire tribute and revenue collected by the Horde in the year it was created. So yeah, imagine your town gets raided and destroyed. At least you can say, yeah, I contributed to that shiny gold horse statue. After it was delivered to the capital, the Khan ordered a second one for symmetry and to depict the overwhelming power of the state. The first mention of the Golden Horses in literature appears in 1254 in the book Journey to the Eastern Countries by William of Rubric, a Flemish Franciscan missionary and explorer. He is best known for his travels to various parts of the Middle East and Central Asia in the 13th century, including the Mongol Empire, and is considered a fairly reliable source. He wrote that the statues blinded everyone approaching the city with their radiance on sunny days. The horse's eyes were made of rubies and emeralds. He also noted that seeing them for the first time from afar made him think that a fire had started in the city. Also, the statues were crafted with such perfection that the master who cast them was slain to prevent anyone else from replicating such beauty in the future. After Batu Khan's death, the horses continued to adorn the entrance to the city until his brother, Berke Khan assumed the role of ruler. Berke Khan then constructed a new capital also named Sarai, which was also referred to as Sarai Berke. The statues were apparently moved there. However, various sources offer conflicting accounts of what happened next. According to one of the versions, one of the horses was interred in the grave alongside Khan Berke, beneath the city wall he constructed. In 1359, the Golden Horde was substantially weakened by a succession crisis and civil unrest, which lasted over 20 years. During this time period, the Russians, who had long been living under the extreme oppression of the Golden Horde, 
were able to reassert some degree of independence from the Mongols. The primary Russian principality to emerge was centered around the city of Moscow. These Russian troops defeated the army of one of the pretenders to the Golden Horde's throne, with this pretender apparently fleeing with one of the Golden Horses. During his flight from the Russian forces, he perished and may have been buried along with the horse by his loyalists. However, the location of his burial site is unknown, with potential locations spanning the vast steppes between the Volga and Don rivers and down to Crimea. The fate of the second horse remains even more mysterious. Legend has it that following numerous military defeats and the weakening of the Golden Horde, small Cossack detachments began raiding its borders. Allegedly, it was these Cossacks who reached Sarai and stole the remaining statue. However, due to its weight, they were unable to make a swift escape and were eventually caught by pursuing Horde forces. All the Cossacks' raiders were slain, but according to the legend, they were not found with the horse. It is theorized that if this story is true, it's likely that the golden horse was concealed somewhere in the steppe. Regardless, by the end of the 14th century, all of the cities of the Golden Horde were raised by Timur, also known as Tamerlane, permanently crippling the Golden Horde. Some speculate that during this invasion, Timur's forces may have looted the horses and brought them back to Persia. Notably, Modern treasure hunters continue the search for these golden horses, given the extreme value associated with them. Most experts speculate that one of the Khan's graves, potentially containing a golden horse, lies along the banks of the Aktuba River near Leninsk in Russia's Volgograd Oblast. The area is known for numerous burial mounds associated with the steppe lords that once ruled Eurasia. As for the elusive second statue, theories abound regarding its fate. Some suggest it may have been intentionally submerged by Cossacks in a steppe river to evade capture. Notably, if these horses are actually recovered, and if they do actually contain 15 tons of gold, one horse alone could be worth nearly $1 billion American at present. Breatharianism. Breatharianism is a belief system that purports humans can live without food or water, subsisting merely on prana, or the energy of the universe. This concept has roots in certain mystical and religious traditions that describe advanced spiritual beings or ascetics who can sustain themselves on light or spirit alone. The modern Western version began gaining attention in the 1970s and 1980s with figures like Wiley Brooks, who founded the Breatharian Institute of America. Breatharian proponents have claimed that they can survive on pranic light, or the energy found in the atmosphere, aligning their practices with Hindu concepts of prana. However, these claims have often been met with skepticism and controversy particularly when individuals have attempted to demonstrate their ability to live without food or water under controlled conditions. Notably, one leading proponent agreed to putting her beliefs to the test under controls, and testing was ceased after four days. Scientifically, the practice has been heavily criticized and linked to multiple unexpected passings. Critics argue that the practice is dangerous and irresponsible, particularly when promoters have been discovered with food or have admitted to eating occasionally. Notably, Wiley Brooks, previously mentioned as one of the founders of the Western version of this practice, was observed consuming a hot dog. Medical professionals uniformly agree that extended fasting without water can lead to severe dehydration, organ failure, and death. Despite these controversies, breatharianism has found new adherence through social media and continues to be featured in alternative spirituality circles. Its leaders often speak at wellness events and offer courses on how to transition to living on light, 
though these events are also met with significant skepticism from the medical and scientific communities. And by significant skepticism, I mean, uniformly, everyone agrees that you cannot do this, and you will not live if you do this. The See He He. This is a suggestion from Discord member CC Noodle. Thanks for this truly bizarre cryptid suggestion. The See He He is a poorly documented cryptid hailing from the island of Java in Indonesia. It is said to either be a hybrid between a cat and goat, or to simply resemble both of these creatures mashed together. Its name derives from the unusual giggling sound it is alleged to make when spotted by humans. According to my research, this cryptid has never been captured on camera or filmed, though there are videos up on YouTube purporting to capture the creature's unusual call. In terms of theories as to what the creature is, some have suggested it's an unknown prehistoric creature, while others have suggested the creature was produced as the result of a deranged experiment. Others have suggested more conventional theories, suggesting that the sound is actually associated with a deer found on the island of Java. This theory suggests this cryptid is actually a form of mass hysteria, with people associating a rare but documented animal noise with a supposed cryptid. Another theory is that the creature is a hyena, or hyenas, released from a private collection or zoo. Notably, the noise supposedly generated by this cryptid does strongly resemble that of a hyena. Further supporting this theory is the fact that hyenas, while typically associated with dogs or assumed to be a form of dog, are actually more closely related to cats than dogs. Be sure to check out the Patreon and the YouTube membership. You can be a supporter for as little as 99 cents. Also, make sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell if you haven't done so already. To each and every one of you watching and listening, I love you guys so much. I'm so grateful for your endless support. Shout out to my patrons, Noah Schubert, Iced Mocha, Kurt the Squirt, Monoxide Wendigo, Jeffer Metcalf, Z Volts, Director Delta, Unknown Delusions, Faye, Jack Russell, and Blasphemous. Big shout out to YouTube member Jordan All. Until next time, stay safe and healthy. Peace out, everyone.